today in this third talk we'll be talking about the way or method of getting a new life. In the first talk we we discussed how a new life is something possible for all human beings. In the second talk we discussed the benefits and advantages of a new life. And in this third talk we will talk about the the technique or method of getting a new life. This is a matter of direct seeing or direct knowing. The Thai word can be translated direct, clear, knowing, or seeing. This is the way of getting a new life. The, the Pali word, which is also becoming known in the West, is vipassana, which is often translated insight. But we might translate it as well, direct spiritual experience. The knowledge that we human beings have comes in various ways. The first way is through listening and reading. We, we get knowledge or information sort of second hand through listening to talks and reading books and things like this. The second way or level of getting inform knowledge is through rational thinking. Taking the information we get and thinking about it in a clear way, reviewing it carefully in our minds, learning about the various cause and effect relationships through rational thinking. And this leads to and, and a kind of understanding, an intellectual or rational understanding. And then the third way of, of knowing something is through direct personal experience of that thing, to, to see it clearly, directly, immediately. Instead of knowing about something indirectly, like hearing about it or thinking about it, to know it directly, to see it directly. In Thai, this is sometimes called to, to directly see, clearly know, and penetrate, thoroughly penetrate, to, to be imbued in something or it is also called vipassana. These are the three ways of knowing, the three levels of knowledge that we have. With each of these three levels, there is on one hand an activity and then the kind of knowledge coming from that activity. With vipassana, the third level, the activity is, we could say, sparking brightness. It's to, to like spark a light, or we could use the word illuminate, to illuminate something. It's comparable to the way we use a, a lighter to start a fire. There's darkness and then we with a small spark, a big fire starts. This is a material example. Of course, the vipassana we're talking about is mental. It's to spark or illuminate the mind, to have direct experience of something in a spiritual way, not a physical or material way, but direct spiritual experience of something. This is the 
activity or condition of vipassana. It's a verb in in this used in this way. Especially nowadays, there are many different systems of vipassana. There's this vipassana and that vipassana being taught in a variety of places. Here, we're interested in the Buddha's vipassana in particular. What interests us in what we try to follow is the system or form or style of vipassana which the Buddha himself practiced and the the kind of vipassana through which the Lord Buddha realized perfect awakening or Buddhahood, which is sometimes called enlightenment. Nowadays there is Tibetan vipassana, Burmese vipassana, Sri Lankan vipassana, Zen vipassana, all kinds of different vipassana going under different names, labels, and so forth. There are now so many of them that people are very confused and don't know which kind of vipassana to choose, and they go wandering around from this one to that. This, however, is not an insolvable problem. What we can do is we can go back to the original vipassana, the vipassana that the Buddha himself used and taught. What has happened in recent times or since the Buddha's times that different teachers have have followed their own inclinations and preferences and to come up with forms or systems of vipassana that suit that particular teacher or this particular teacher in various places, times, and cultures. And so then there have arisen these various later forms of vipassana created by which different teachers have thought up by themselves. Here we don't want to get into Thai vipassana or Suanmok vipassana. We don't want to just come up with a new, another new system. Rather, we would like to go back to the original vipassana of the Buddha. This is what we study and then use that knowledge from studying in order to practice the original, the pristine vipassana. As for those newly developed forms of vipassana, we can see that some of them require that we we make sounds or noises. Other of these forms require that we use certain postures or positions of the body. Sometimes we need some external object like a Buddha image to practice some of these systems. And there are various different requirements and things we need to do with these different forms of vipassana. But with the original pristine vipassana, we don't need any of these things. Everything we need to use, we've already got. It's already happening naturally and we don't have to buy or or make or do anything new. Instead, we can use all the things we originally have within our, our life. And so, though you may sometimes wonder why we don't have these special extras, you can begin to appreciate the simplicity of the pristine form of vipassana, the vipassana of the Buddha. This is what we'll be looking into and studying in today's talk.
Now what we're saying here isn't intended to get into arguments or debates over what kind of vipassana is better. This isn't our purpose because in fact there's a very simple way that we can we can come to agreement among all the different systems of vipassana whether original or or later versions. We, the point where we of mutual understanding is that no matter what kind of vipassana it is, if it leads to direct realization of the non-selfhood of the five khandhas or of life, then then it's real vipassana. No matter what kind of vipassana if it leads to us seeing that the five khandhas, that is, the five groups or basic functions of life, the physical functions, that the function of feeling, of discrimination, of thought conception, and of sense consciousness, these five basic physical and mental functions are called the khandhas or we can just summarize it as body and mind, or even more simply, life. To have the direct spiritual realization that in the five khandhas in life, there is nothing that is a self or soul. There is nothing <clears throat> worth clinging to as I or mine. Any, any vipassana that leads to this realization is genuine vipassana whether it's in a Mahayana package or a Theravada package or some strange and wonderful Tibetan package. That doesn't matter. All the important Mahayana suttas end with the non-selfhood of the five groups or functions, the five khanda, the five aggregates. And so really we're not talking about Mahayana or Theravada. These are unimportant distinctions. What we're talking about is pristine or original Buddhism that gets to the realization that in life there is nothing that we can call a self or a soul. Life is anatta. This is the, the meeting point of all systems of vipassana. <coughs> Some of the superficial differences that appear before the, between the different systems are not really important. For example, it's common to develop concentration, samati, first, and then use that concentration in the practice of insight or vipassana. This is very, this is the general approach. But in Zen, they don't, they don't do that. They mix or they combine concentration and insight and call it Zen all at once. And the, the result explodes outward in sudden enlightenment. This can work and achieve the same realization and benefits as well. The difference is more in externals. Or then there's the, some of the old traditional ways that we still find around Thailand, where we have to break it up into a number of stages. First, there is morality, taking the taking of moral precepts, and then developing concentration, and then practicing insight. But sometimes this all gets turned into a big ceremony or ritual so that the morality becomes a ceremony of taking precepts and the and we have to do some chants before we can even do concentration and then developing concentration becomes a bit of a ceremony and then sometimes the the insight gets lost in all the ceremony. And so we have to be careful 
about all these external distinctions. And so what we would like to advise here is a way of practice that combines morality, concentration, and insight all in one practice. And this is the vipassana of the Buddha, which the Buddha himself taught. Something we'd like to go in to a little bit more detail on is about some of the more popular forms of vipassana. These kinds of vipassana that include a lot of ceremonies and rituals and, and bowing and chants in this tend to be very popular, not just in Thailand but all around the world, including the West. These forms of vipassana where we begin by offering ourselves to the teacher, to the vipassana teacher, giving ourselves up to the guru. This, these kind of forms are quite popular. And then we do various ceremonies in chants or even prayers in order for morality. And then even to begin to develop concentration often begins with a chant or sometimes a prayer asking for concentration. We don't know who we're asking, but somebody is being asked, please give me concentration, please give me rapture, please give me bliss, and the various things. And then asking and, and praying and chanting for, for insight, for realization, for attainments. These forms are, are very popular. It seems that people like or enjoy or are attracted by the magical overtones or the, the sacredness, the holiness of some of these, these forms that, that has meaning for them. And there's, this is okay. We're not criticizing these things, even if sometimes the ceremonies tend to get in the way of the vipassana. It doesn't matter so much as long as it ends up in realization or insight into, the, into anatta, the, into non-self, non-selfhood or selflessness. Even if it's a little bit of a roundabout way, if it comes to this realization of anatta, then it's good enough. Then it, it gets to where it needs to go. So these different forms, some of them have various surface characteristics that attract people and so we find certain forms that are quite popular. But always remember what matters is not the, the surface things, the attractive or interesting qualities, it's the realization of anatta, of not-self, that is the essence of vipassana. Now we'd like to discuss the kind of vipassana that, that we need here, the kind of vipassana of the Buddha. The first thing to do in this vipassana is to look at our old life, look at the old life, to see it for what it really is, to, to, to see how boring and wearisome the old way of life is. Remember the way we described it in the first talk. The old life is like a rope around the neck pulling in one direction and another one around the feet pulling in the other direction and then fires scorching us around the middle. This is a simile for the old life and this, this kind of vipassana begins by examining the old life until seeing how, how boring, how tiresome, how wearisome it is. It's important that you understand what we mean when we say the old life. 
When we say the old life, what we mean is the life of upadana or attachment. The Pali word for this is upadana and it's translated into English in a variety of ways. To attach to, to cling to, to grasp at are, are ways of trying to express the the upadana of the old life, the, the clutching and clinging and grasping at things. This is to attach to things as positive and negative, as good and bad. This is the old life, the, the life of attachment. This is what we have to see first of all. To under Without understanding attachment or upadana, there's no way of, no way one could understand the old life. So to help you, we'll like to point out there are two ways of taking hold of something, of picking something up. One way is the way of attachment, to take something and cling to it, to clutch at it. This is upadana. But there's another way to pick something up or to take something, to take an idea or a practice or whatever. And that is called samadana. Upadana and samadana are two different ways of taking or holding something. Samadana is to take something with mindfulness and wisdom, with awareness and understanding, with wisdom to pick something up and hold it without clinging to it, without attaching to it. The distinction is very important and very clear. The difference between clinging and just holding. One way is that of the old life. Samadana to hold things, use them, is with mindfulness in wisdom. This is learned through, through vipassana because through vipassana we develop the knowledge and understanding of how things are and what they are. And then we can take them, we can use them with mindfulness and wisdom rather than attachment. So if you understand these two ways of taking something, of holding something, the difference between attaching and just holding and using. This will help you to understand the difference between the old life and new life. There's a metaphor which shows the difference between upadana and samadana very clearly. If we pick something up with upadana, then it will bite us. If we pick something up with samadana, then it's safe, it doesn't bite. So we can see the difference in these two ways of holding things, of taking them. The one in which we get bit, clawed, chewed on, and the way in which we don't get bitten or chewed upon. The first way is that of upadana, to pick something up in a way that it bites us that we are punished by whatever it is we are attaching to. And we are punished by dukkha itself. This is what the old life is full of. The old life is full of this holding on to things in a way that they bite us, that we are punished with dukkha. If we can understand the distinction, the distinction between holding to something in a way that we are bitten by it and holding something in a way that we are not bitten, then we will be able to understand what the old life is like. Then we will start to lose our contentment with it, we'll stop being satisfied with living life in that way and we'll start to genuinely be interested in 
living a new life. The only way to see, to clearly see this difference is through vipassana, to understand what it is like to be bitten by things all the time. And then we, through vipassana, we truly see the old life for what it is. Through vipassana, or this first stage of vipassana then, is to see the dukkha, the suffering, the pain of the old life in where we're getting bitten by things all the time. This is the necessary first step of vipassana. When there is this seeing the old life as being full of dukkha, then there is the, the loosening of attachment to that life. There is the loosening or the weakening, the lessening, the dissipating and dissolving of attachment. In Pali, this is called viraka, viraka. Sometimes viraka is used as a synonym for nipan. But we can say at least it's the starting point, the beginning point of Nipan, the loosening, the dissolving of attachment. In Thai there are some words that express viraka very easily. They can roughly be translated as loosening up or weakening or fading. And a simile that expresses this very well is a cloth that has been dyed with a variety of colors, very strong, bright, brilliant colors. When that cloth is left in the sun, those colors begin to, to fade. They dissolve, they break up and become lighter and lighter, more and more faint. This fading away of these colors is one, one way of expressing viraka, the fading away of attachment. Now you can figure it out for yourself that if something dissolves and fades away and fades away and fades away, eventually it's gone, it's finished, it's ended, there's nothing left. And so this is what happens, attachment fades and fades and fades, and then there's no more attachment. Attachment is ended. So this is the third stage of vipassana. We can see that there are at least these three stages. The first stage is seeing, seeing things as they really are, seeing them for what they are, seeing them truly. And then attachment fades away, it weakens, it dissolves, it breaks up and fades away. And then the third stage is attachment ends, and there is no more attachment. These are three necessary stages of vipassana. Then there's a bonus. This bonus or extra special step may not be absolutely important but it's, it's considered vipassana as well. Once attachment has ended, then the bonus is to, to realize that the mind is liberated, the mind is released, has transcended all attachment, is completely free and at peace. This is the bonus step. And so there are these four stages to vipassana. First, seeing things truly, then the dissolving and fading away of attachment, third, the end of attachment, and fourth, this special bonus of, of realizing that the mind is completely liberated from all attachment. Some of you may have remembered that we talked about morality, that the Buddha's vipassana 
includes morality and so maybe you're wondering well where's the morality in this the answer that is in having the discipline having the self-control to make oneself to do this practice to do what is necessary for these four stages of insight to occur that is moral training or moral practice being able to to apply oneself to force oneself to do what is necessary this this morality is automatically included in vipassana and then where is the concentration in all this when we are determined to see things as they really are when we really are our mind is really focused and steadfast and determined to realize these the truths of vipassana then concentration sufficient concentration will arise this happens automatically or naturally that when the mind is really determined to do something enough adequate concentration will arise for example if we want to throw a rock or a stone at a target to do that the mind will develop sufficient concentration to successfully do it if the if we're really determined to do that the concentration will arise this is a very natural thing that when there is enough determination then the concentration will arise the buddha said that and so the way this works with excuse me the way this works with vipassana is when there is the mind is really set on developing insight on seeing clearly then that concentration will arise concentration and insight go together like this the buddha said for there cannot be concentration unless there is wisdom wisdom and insight are synonyms and there cannot be wisdom without concentration if one has wisdom there will be concentration and when one has concentration there will be wisdom they they arise together they're natural they support each other we can't really separate the two and so even in something like shooting aiming and shooting a gun that requires concentration and the necessary concentration will arise if we're genuinely determined to do it correctly so in this vipassana concentration enough sufficient concentration nothing fancy but enough to get the job done will arise naturally and then where is faith where is faith in all this when there is vipassana faith will arise automatically as well in an evolutionist religion like this faith follows from insight and wisdom in creationist religions faith comes before wisdom there is some belief and faith in something outside oneself and then wisdom will follow after that that faith and belief but in the evolutionist religions like Buddhism faith comes after insight when we see something clearly to the degree we see it clearly we have faith in that truth and as vipassana develops then faith develops after that development of insight or we can see there is some insight and then there is faith follows from that insight that faith supports the further development of insight and then faith grows as well and as faith is growing it continues to support the development of wisdom but in in vipassana in buddhism 
faith is following from wisdom. It doesn't come before. And so you can see that in Vipassana there is moral training, there is concentration, and there is faith, automatic, all within the, the one thing of Vipassana. Then we can look and see if any of these is weak or insufficient, if there's not enough morality or not enough concentration, not enough faith, then we can work or train, we can study, train or practice specifically on that area. For example, if we see that morality is weak, then we can specifically work on developing morality. But to do so we have to use insight and wisdom anyway, so that it is wise morality. Or if concentration is inadequate, then we can work at the strengthening concentration. But to do so, we do this with insight as well. And then if faith is lacking, we can study, we can, we can consider and do whatever is needed to develop stronger faith. But still, this is done through vipassana. So no matter what, we can't avoid vipassana. To have morality, concentration, faith, or whatever, we need to be practicing and developing insight or wisdom. Finally, we can't avoid reminding or insisting that the, the way of practicing this complete and correct vipassana is through anapanasati, mindfulness on breathing, the 16 step or four tetrad approach to anapanasati as taught by the Buddha. Through this practice, a complete and correct vipassana will develop and be practiced and there will be nothing lacking or missing. It will be perfect vipassana. So, please be very interested in studying further the practice of anapanasati. We've, we, today we've explained the essence of anapanasati, which is vipassana. Anapanasati, or mindfulness of breathing, is Vipassana. There are more details to it which we, we recommend you to look into, study, and then practice further. And so today we'll leave you with this reminder that to practice Vipassana correctly, successfully, for the highest benefits, there is no better way than by practicing the 16 steps of anapanasati as taught by the Buddha. This is the original or pristine vipassana. And the rain is forcing us to, to end the meeting at this point, so we'll have to stop a little early so we, we all don't get wet and catch cold. <laughs>